our third and final video for electrochemistry chapter 17 covers the highest number of slides but the good news is it doesn't have any equations to worry about okay so the most important part of the chapter by far in terms of calculations was in the second video what you should focus on as you listen to video three is a lot of the conceptual information that's presented because that will be what's assessed. Okay, we're going to start by talking about batteries and then we'll talk about corrosion and then lastly electrolysis. Okay, so let's think about a couple of different types of batteries, most of which you've probably encountered in your everyday life. First question, what is a battery, right? It's either a single electrochemical cell or nowadays a series of electrochemical cell that gives us an electric current, right? It has to have a positive cell potential, be able to do work with the electrons that are produced. And a perfect battery, right, is something that would last forever, give you the same voltage throughout its entire life, and it would hold up to heat and humidity. Right? Think about everything that you would want in your cell phone battery. Right? And what's the most common complaint? Cell phone batteries run out too fast. Okay? And you could have a cell phone battery that lasts for weeks or months or however long you want on a single charge. Right? The drawback is it would be the size of a brick. Right? So those are the challenges that you have to consider in battery production, right? Mass, the size, the cost, right? how reliable they are, the current capacity, and other things like that. Because you want it to be giving a constant voltage throughout as well. You don't want a rush of electricity at the end and then it peters off. It has to be constant from 100% to 0%. So keep those in mind as we walk through a couple of different types of batteries, starting with primary batteries, right? And these are the Duracells or the energizers that you traditionally think about. You use them one time, you can't recharge them, so you use them and then you recycle them. And the most common primary battery type is a dry cell zinc carbon battery, which undergoes the reaction in the middle there. Okay, It involves manganese oxide, ammonium chloride, and solid zinc. All right, And zinc, you see, gets oxidized there from zinc zero to zinc two as part of the reaction. Okay? And zinc is actually what the battery container is made of, the walls of the battery. Okay? And that's why those batteries inevitably end up leak leaking because zinc gets consumed. Okay? And these primary batteries have a cell potential of about one and a half volts regardless of the size, right? Which is to say that a D battery, a C, a double A, a triple A, they all deliver the same voltage. Right? The difference is those larger batteries, the Ds and the Cs, are delivering more moles of electrons than the smaller batteries are. Okay. And we've got pictures of each type of these batteries as we go through. Right? Feel free to take a look at any of them as we proceed. Okay, This is the dry cell battery. What about an alkaline battery, okay? which is much more efficient than the dry cell, okay? about five times? Now we've got zinc and manganese as our primary components. Okay? The new player here in this game, right? they're more efficient about the same voltage. The big drawback of the alkaline batteries, see that hydroxide there, right? Potassium hydroxide is what's used in those alkaline batteries, which can leak and you don't want a strong base leaking onto your fingers. So two types of primary batteries. Here's a picture of that alkaline battery. How about what's known as a secondary battery? Those were primary, this is secondary. These are the types of batteries that you can recharge, right? So it's not just use it and recycle it, use it and you can recharge it. And they can do a, these, right, they do these, they can be recharged a thousand times or more, even with the technology that's been improved nowadays. Yeah. And these secondary batteries were first dis developed around a nickel cadmium battery. You've probably heard of nickel cad. The voltage there just slightly less, about one and a quarter volts. Right? The primary drawback of these secondary batteries is the fact that they use cadmium 
metal, and that's a toxic metal. So any type of battery, but particularly secondary batteries, you always want to be sure to dispose of the batteries properly, like recycle them in an appropriate facility, never just toss them in the trash. Okay. Here we see our nickel CAD battery. How about a lithium ion battery? Those are the ones that everybody's heard about. That's what's in your cell phone. Okay. Much higher voltage, also much lower mass. Right? Notably lighter than all of these other types of batteries. Okay? And they, depending on the battery type and the manufacturer, have some different types of reactions, but the general reaction scheme down there, shown at the bottom, with some lithium, some cobalt, and some oxygen, and C6, right, dealing with some graphene in these lithium ion batteries. Right? The drawback, you've probably heard of it, like with hoverboards and other types of things. Right, if the separator in lithium ion starts to degrade, then you run the risk of them exploding, right? Because as that separator degrades, it starts to heat up the um, battery itself, which then um, makes the problem even worse. It starts to speed it up. And then as soon as we get exposed to oxygen, these batteries explode. And here's an image of your lithium ion battery. And lastly, we have a lead acid battery. These are what are used in your car, unless you have an electric car. Okay? So lead acid batteries are what are used to start a internal combustion engine vehicle. Okay? It's made up of six cells in line, two volts per cell, total of 12 volts. Okay? They are heavy, right? If you've ever picked up a car battery, you know how heavy they are, but they've got a really high current density. They're also cheap. Okay, though, just like before, they are caustic, right, and it has lead, so you need to dispose of these properly as well. The overall reaction for your lead acid battery shown there, okay, and an image of the lead acid battery as well. You won't have to memorize any of those um, reactions for the different batteries. Just know the uh, which ones are more advantageous than others, and the fact that batteries have to have a positive cell potential. Right? It has to be a spontaneous reaction. You would never, never make a battery out of a non-spontaneous reaction. Switching gears a little bit now to think about fuel cells. Okay, If you've heard of fuel cells before, it's different from a battery. Right, So we're not using fuel cells in cars, we're using them in things like satellites or submarines because they're a lot more efficient. Fuel cells typically have an energy of efficiency of about 40 to 60% as opposed to an internal combustion engine, which tops out at like 25 to 35%. And so they're similar to a battery in that we're thinking about electrochemistry, not just the combustion reaction, but a fuel cell requires a source of fuel, which is typically hydrogen. Yep. They convert chemical energy to electrical energy. Here we see consideration of a hydrogen and oxygen fuel cell. Right? And the big advantage here, look at that overall reaction. The only byproduct is water. So that's a nice clean reaction. And that's going to give you about 2 million times more power than a typical battery right? in your fuel cells. And that's a big consideration in the future of clean energy. And we first have to figure out how to harness and store hydrogen and oxygen, but you can imagine all the energy that's produced from that fuel cell. That finishes 17.5, batteries and fuel cells. Now we go to 17.6, a quick discussion of corrosion, right, where we see metals degrade over time because of electrochemistry. You see iron rust, right, or a copper patent note, like what we have here with the Statue of Liberty. So let's think about rust, okay? What goes on here, especially in the rust belt, right? We see it all the time. What is rust? It's not iron. Now, the actual rust is what's down here, that iron three oxide hydrate. That's what rust is. Okay? So how does that form? Okay, well, iron going to iron two, right, has a negative reduction potential. But if we think about that, in concert with oxygen, right, that positive cell potential all of a sudden makes that anode completely feasible because it's cathode minus anode. So that overall reaction to take iron 
to iron two, right, positive 1.67 volts, that's a spontaneous process. And then as soon as we have iron two available and exposed to oxygen, which we said it already is, right, it readily converts to that iron three oxide hydrate. Easy to do, okay? And then that continues because there's no protective layer. So what's the easiest way to prevent that from happening? Well, you have to prevent the iron from being exposed to oxygen, and you do that by painting it. That's the quickest and easiest way to prevent it. Okay. However, it doesn't last forever. You've probably seen rust spots outside on cars, other things, because as soon as that paint layer gets chipped or scratched, okay, then it's gone away and your iron is exposed to oxygen and water. Then we start to rust. So how else can we prevent things from rusting? You've probably heard of, if you've ever looked into hardware, right, galvanized nails or galvanized screws. And you hear that word galvanized, it means the iron is plated in zinc. And the nice thing it, there is the zinc isn't just serving as a paint, right? Zinc also has a lower reduction potential than does iron, meaning it's even easier to oxidize. So even if that zinc gets scratched, well, we don't care. It wasn't really serving as a paint to begin with. The zinc always gets oxidized before the iron. So that's one way to do it. You can also do it by a method known as cathodic protection, which is where you make whatever metal you're trying to protect the cathode, okay? because then you don't have to worry about it being oxidized to something that'll form a different thing. So if you're making that metal the cathode, you have to have something else that you're willing to sacrifice to be the anode. Hence, you have to use a sacrificial anode. So when you're doing cathodic protection, you have to periodically monitor these things and replace them as necessary. They're usually stored underground. You use it in things like storage tanks or sometimes with pipes, hot water heaters, things like that. And this is what it looks like, this underground tank, right? You're protecting it from oxidizing by using a sacrificial anode, okay? And they have to be connected with one another. This Here it looks like a big container, but usually it's just like a small rod. Okay? You also see it used with like ships, the sides of ships, for example. Okay? So again, more conceptual ideas from 17.6. Let's finish the chapter with 17.7, the idea of electrolysis. Yeah. Now, electrolysis deals with electrolytic cells, which are the direct opposite of a galvanic cell, right? Galvanic or voltaic cells, which were introduced in the first video, always have a spontaneous reaction, and they're producing electricity. An electrolytic cell is the opposite of that. This is where we have two things together where it would be non-spontaneous, but we put electrical energy into the system to cause it to occur, right? So forcing an electrolytic cell to happen, that process is known as electrolysis. Every night when you charge your phone, putting electricity back into it, reversing the reaction that's occurring throughout the day when it's unplugged, that's an electrolytic process. So different process, but exact same principles as what we did before. If we think about the electrolysis of molten sodium chloride, which is how sodium metal and chlorine gas are produced, that cell potential is negative four volts. So it's clearly non-spontaneous. What does that information tell us? Well, I have to apply a voltage of four volts or more into the system in order to get that reaction to move forward. And this is what that reaction looks like, right? See producing chlorine gas and sodium. How about the electrolysis of water, right? A non-spontaneous process, right? Overall down here, E cell is equal to negative 1.229, right? Non-spontaneous process, but this is one of the things that ties into what we talked about before. Okay? Splitting water to produce hydrogen and oxygen is one of the steps that's necessary into a green future. Right? Harnessing those two individually and then storing them, using them later for energy. Okay? And this is what the electrolysis of water looks like. 
You've also maybe heard of electroplating. Okay, electroplating, maybe you've even done it in a previous lab. All right, electroplating is when you put a thin coating of one metal on top of another metal, which was a conducting service, right? You've used electrochem to plate a metal on top of another one. And it has a lot of different applications, right? You can electroplate a surface you're trying to predict, protect for like corrosion resistance, okay? Which is not to say that that's how uh, zinc is done when things are galvanized. Typically those are just dipped into molten zinc. But you can use electroplating for corrosion resistance. You can use it to make something stronger. You can use it to make something pure. You can use it to make something prettier, right? With the aesthetic finishes. That's how your silver plated jewelry is made with electroplating. Hey, you've got some sort of cheaper metal and you are plating the silver on top of it. Yep. And that's done by using actual silver metal in a solution with silver nitrate. <clears throat> Here's an example using spoon. Okay, this is how cheaper jewelry, or sorry, I used jewelry before. Uh, silverware is used. Typically you don't have in your drawer a real silver spoon. Right? It's called silverware because it's electroplated with silver on top, right? Taking a silver anode, right? Connecting it using whatever metal you're coating there as the cathode, and then the silver gets coated on top. Okay. But again, it requires energy to force that non spontaneous reaction to occur. And that wraps up 17.7 .7 there. Again, just more conceptual ideas. Just know that electrolysis is non spontaneous. We have to put energy greater than the cell potential to get it to occur. Okay, you know those conceptual ideas, the conceptual ideas about batteries and corrosion, and that wraps up chapter 17.